back to Metamorphosis tonight with our studio guest, William Goldstein. Most people recognize Mr. Goldstein for the scoring of the TV series Fame, for which he was nominated for an Emmy. However, Mr. Goldstein has also written music for feature films such as The Quarrel and Saving Grace, and he wrote music for documentaries for the National Geographic Society, as well as he did a musical tribute to Jacques Cousteau. He was also commissioned to write music for historical events, such as a bicentennial for the 200 years celebration of the in, uh, Declaration of Independence. And on top of that, he's an innovator of new technology. He's considered to be the first man in the world who uh, scored music directly into a computer. Aside from that, he is a visiting artist of the American Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, as well as he's a member of its foreign language committee. And he's also a founder of the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art, and he has lectured and taught worldwide, including Israel, America, and Asia. Tonight, I wanted to show you and lead you through three st uh, stages of Mr. Goldstein's life and introduce you to some of his music. Mr. Goldstein, in your biography, I read that you were only nine years old when your mother took you to Columbia University and introduced you to Professor Raymond Burroughs. Um, I was wondering, did you receive any formal training there then at age nine, or how? No, what I, happened I, after that? Well, I hadn't received any formal training prior to seeing Mr. Burroughs. And my formal training, uh, Mr. Burroughs made a lot of suggestions to my mother at the time, none of which were practical. So um, I basically developed on my own, but Mr. Burroughs told her it would be like trying to stop the river heading towards the sea, and that when I got to a point where I needed a teacher, I would find one, but I didn't have formal study until uh, l later on. And, and later on, I got plenty of formal study when I was in college. And then when I was in high school, I had a great music teacher who uh, taught me a little theory and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Do you come from a musical family? I do not. You do not. And um, Which is not unusual amongst uh -huh. composers. There are as many stories of uh, composers coming from non-musical backgrounds as there are the Mozart and Bach stories. Mm -hmm. And was your childhood anyhow um, different from other people since you were um, young and you had Well, this outside experience? of the fact that I'd go to a movie when I was eight years old and come back and play you the score, or most of what I heard, uh, now I was pretty front of the mill. Perhaps I was a little more intuitive, a little more sensitive, but I wasn't aware of any other differences. Mm -hmm. Um, before um, Barry Gordy, the founder of Motown, um, put you under contract, the head of the creative department, Susan DePass, called to you, I read, and asked you, are you ready to be a star? How was that moment for you? It was pretty exciting, and I wasn't quite sure what she was talking about, since uh, Motown hadn't uh, signed any white artists at the time, although I think that Pat Boone actually may have recorded for them, but it was all it was all rather shocking. I was in New York, and uh, she told me everything I'd ever wanted to hear about my career. Mm -hmm. And so, um, naturally, I was very excited and very interested, and it turned out to be a really remarkable experience. The the, the two years I was under uh, exclusive contract to Motown, and then uh, I did work uh, on several projects for them afterwards as well. You scored 48 episodes of Fame, and you wrote music for Jermaine Jackson and Smokey Robinson. Was it difficult for you to evolve from that music genre into a more classical one? Well, the reason they hired me to do Fame was because I did everything. I did classically oriented things. I, I did pop and R&B. And then later, as you mentioned, I, I got very much involved in electronic music as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I seem to have um, a facility for, for picking up and absorbing things and then translating it into my own style. How did ABC commission you or pick you out to, um, to write the, the, the music for these historical pieces? Uh, I was doing work for them uh, in their promotion department doing a promotional uh, music uh, for their annual uh, network conventions out here in Los Angeles. And they liked the work so much, they asked me to do some of the on-air uh, themes for them. Can we maybe listen to one of those, the last ones you did, the Millennium piece? Please. OK.
that since 2000. <laughs> Um, Mr. Goldstein, aside from writing music for um, films such as The Quarrel and Remembrance of Love, you continued working on a Holocaust theme and you did your own musical called Haven. What made you decide to write something f about the Holocaust? Well, it really hadn't anything to do with the Holocaust. It happens that I became friends with Ruth Gruber in the early 80s. And Ruth Gruber, who is one of the most remarkable people through the 20th century, and she's still going strong, she's now 92 years old, uh, wrote a book called Haven, and, and she and I had been friends for many years, and I thought her book would make a wonderful movie, never saw it as a musical, and then when Jerome Coopersmith and Joe Darian started working on it, Ruth mentioned it to me, and I thought if they could turn this wonderful story uh, into a musical, I'd like to be a part of it, and, and yes, it does deal peripherally with issues of the Holocaust, but it, it's mostly about um, reminding all of us, you know, in, in, in America that freedom isn't free and those of us here are lucky to be here and I, I, I know that uh, you, for instance, come from Germany and uh, you're a perfect example of what makes this country strong. People have a desire to, to be here because we have, we have so much to offer. How was the musical perceived by the audience? Of Haven? Yes. Well, we got standing ovations every night, that's all I know. I assume that was because people were moved mm -hmm. by the story. Can we maybe listen to some of Haven or see something of it? Uh, that'd be wonderful. Tell of millions of refugees flooding Europe in the wake of the Allied invasion. Homeless, war-scarred victims of Hitler's madness. They look to the world for help. I was lucky to get a thousand approved. There must be a hundred times this many. Maybe millions without homes, without hope. We have got to do better than this. I asked for 10,000 to start with, maybe more later on. Some stalwarts in our government opted for none. The State Department. That's an excellent guess. Are there any challenges involved in writing music, for instance, for a musical as opposed to um, film or television? Other obstacles or challenges? Well, I think there are challenges in each medium, and the challenges are, are different. Uh, Haven was very, very difficult because of the sensitivity of the material that you're working with. Uh, you had to be careful that you were not uh, patronizing or commercializing you know, very, very difficult uh, human uh, historical issues. I mean, some of the greatest trauma of mankind. Uh, you know, it was very difficult to tell in uh, in a in a musical format. And what's going to happen to Haven now? Does it go on tour? Well, or? we hope uh, we hope to tour it. Uh, the subject matter is uh, not commercial. It's not uh, hairspray or you're in town. Um, uh, I do believe that uh, if it tours, based upon the reaction we got from audiences here, that it will do very well and could become a classic uh, musical. I mean, my collaborator who wrote the lyrics, Joe Darian, did write the lyrics for Man of La Mancha, and that's done very, very well. Mm -hmm. But yeah. you're not the child of Holocaust survivors or no. anything like this. So no, no, there's my no parents were born here. Yes. Well, personal. I mean, I'm a human being. I think uh, yes. anybody who, and and I have a love of history, and I think anybody who looks at the human condition and looks at the horrors of what happened uh, World War II, and they've happened before and they've happened since, it's it's a very disturbing part of the human condition and uh, we try to find meaning from from these things and mm -hmm. as we try to find meaning from our own lives in 1996 you wrote an article 
that was published in the Los Angeles Times, and you expressed your concern about the inaccessibility of serious music in the latter part of the 20th century. And you also stressed the importance of music that is emotionally connective. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Right. You're referring to Making Art Passionately, which any of your viewers can find on my website, williamgoldstein.com. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, when I was a student um, at Manhattan School of Music in the 60s, I used to go to a lot of uh, contemporary concerts. Uh, given by the New York Philharmonic, and they were doing all kinds of things which were way, way out there. And um, I was very open to them. I thought I was young. I would learn what, what this is all about, and then I would begin to understand it and appreciate it. But what I finally came to understand was that there wasn't much to understand because uh, true genius is not the ability to take the commonalities of life and make them obtuse, but rather the ability to take the complexities of life and give them meaning. And any artist who creates a work that nobody gets 10, 15, 20 years after the fact has really failed, despite what those critics who may claim such work as genius have to say, but the critics have their own little agendas, which is to further their own career by becoming the high priest and interpreter of that which nobody else understands. But in, in musical history, um, for instance, in 1913, when Stravinsky wrote uh, Sacre de Proutamp, uh, Rite of Spring, which was premiered in uh, Paris, it was, uh, there was a big outrage, uh, it was a scandal, you know, this is not music, people said. And within 10 years, the 20s, it was an already an orchestral staple. But here you have work that was created in the 60s. And, uh, you know, and, and later on that, that, you know, given how fast communication goes around the world these days, you think if there was any value in something, it would have been, you know, just become accepted and understood, but it never has. So you and the truth is, let me, forgive me yes, for uh, interrupting you, yeah. but I, the, the truth is that uh, today there's been a, a, a reaction against all of that. Uh, and uh, Serious music and serious art has once again become comprehensible because let's face it, once you push the envelope of, of uh, experimentation to the point of complete anarchy, there's nowhere else to go except to bring back order and cosmos to the universe. Well, let's just listen to some of your music and get an idea what, what you just talked about. Well. It seems that if your music is, it comes after a conflict and a knot loosens up. And is that what you refer well, to emotional connectiveness or that people can all, relate to? All that? of the life cycles are the building up of tension and the relaxing of tension. All great art, or music, literature, film is the building up of tension and the relaxing of tension. Um, this is the natural order of things. Uh, the first excerpt that you played was from my solo piano album, and, uh, which was a collection of improvisations, and the other two pieces were for film. Uh, the music I write strictly for a concert hall may be a little bit uh, uh, different. And on the, on the piano album, there are, there's a wide range of, of, of things. But certainly, um, I like to write music that people can understand. 
Uh, it's heavily influenced by composers such as Rachmaninoff and Debussy. Well, and well, different things are influenced by different people. Yeah, I love I love Rachmaninoff mm -hmm. and uh, most most of the Russian composers and uh, Ravel and Debussy and Aaron Copland and. Uh, Gershwin and any number of guys writing movie scores who are colleagues of mine. So you and don't Bach, I love Bach. Mm -hmm. I love improvising in the style. You don't of see Bach. a danger involved in uh, transposing classical music into more popular music. Well, I w would never think of the word danger in danger. association <laughs> with uh, <laughs> anything like that. I don't think there's any danger. Dan yeah. Okay. Um, People can be accused of bad taste, however. No, I wouldn't say that. Or, or plagiarism. <laughs> I tried to uh -huh. avoid that. As a matter of fact, I will tell you, I saw the movie Troy, and I was rather dismayed as to why a composer like James Horner uh, quoted, without giving credit, uh, the Shostakovich Fifth Symphony. Over and over again, this one theme that Shostakovich is, is in this movie, and you know, I guess it got by everybody. Mm -hmm. So who knows? And the artists always inspire each other and take things and... Well, in inspiration is one thing. Um, blatantly um, lifting things, whether, you know, I I'm sure it was unconscious on the part of Mr. Horner, but nevertheless, there it was. Mr. Goldstein, what have you been doing lately? Um, I... I've been going back and forth to New York a lot. <laughs> well, what about the... Um, you? created a DVD with a dancer? Ah, yes. Well, uh, once a year, uh, and I'm thinking I'd like to do this more than once a year, I, I've done a master class in improvisation uh, every summer on the campus of Cal Arts as part of uh, my uh, support of the California State Summer School for the Arts, now called InterSpark. And um, improvisation is not something you you, you really can't do if you don't have somewhat of a gift, but I, I certainly can unlock the process for a lot of gifted students, and the students who attend uh, the master class are, are film, music, dance, creative writing people. And uh, last summer they asked me to work with a very gifted uh, dancer who happened to be from China who had just done some postgraduate work at Cal Arts, whose name is Qi Zhang. And the chemistry uh, at this master class was so out outstanding, we just improvised a few ballets out of nowhere, that we decided to film a few and uh, have something to show people in order to do more concerts. So we um, very much interested. This, to me, is really insight into the creative process because it comes with no preparation other than your own, where you're at in your, your, your art and your developmental skills. And it's not only one person improvising, it's two people interacting and ha basically having a simultaneous conversation. I speak the language of music, she speaks the language of dance. And the improvisation that most people are familiar with is jazz improvisation, but jazz improvisation is built around existing structures. You're, you're improvising around a tune and what we're doing is completely free composition. It starts from nowhere and it develops a, a, an idea and, a, and at the end of the, the piece you have a complete piece with form and shape. But when you look at these things, it's very hard for people to believe that it was created th that way. But also on my website there is a review from the Los Angeles Times dance critic, Louis Siegel, who reviewed a concert I did, I think in 2000, uh, which I closed with another dancer uh, in an improvised ballet, and he was just uh, blown away. So if you have something that Chi and I have done, I think your yeah, audience would love let's it. let's take a look at that. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Mr. Golson on the DVD, it almost looks as if you have a symbiosis with the dancer. You're on the picture as well. Is that what you con refer to? Is that what you mean by uh, referring to emotional connectiveness in music? Well, I refer to emotional connectiveness in music uh, that between the artist and the audience there's emotional connect connectiveness. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if two people are improvising, they're they're in tune in in even a closer way than just emotionally. There, you know, I mean, uh, as you can tell by watching this uh, excerpt, um, she and I were exactly on the same page, creating a, a work together, co-collaborating in effect, music and choreography. It's quite remarkable, actually. There are very few people in the world who ever do this sort of thing, because there aren't too many people who can, I guess. Uh, I mean, amongst my colleagues, in all modesty, I don't know anybody who does this sort of improvisational work. Mr. Golson, it seems as, as if you have done it all. <laughs> I haven't. Post. You haven't. What is left? <laughs> what no, is your dream for the future? Well, there's a lot I haven't done. I wouldn't mind writing. Uh, I may write a piano concerto for a very talented young pianist named Terence Wilson. We're talking about that. Um, working on another Broadway musical. I'm developing some film projects as a producer as well as a composer. Not that I want to leave any of the composing behind, but um, if I'm working on a movie, it might as well be one that I'm really interested in. So I'm developing uh, some projects. And, uh, and I want to do more on the improvisational side, I want to do more of these uh, concerts and probably some more guest lecturing on university campuses. Uh, I enjoy the interaction. Well, thank you for our conversation today and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. It's my pleasure, Simone.